We're in the old railroad town of Susquehanna, Pennsylvania as we wrap up our first weekend across state line. We're going to follow these railroad tracks right downtown and find out what's on tap at Iron Horse Brewing Company. Across the nation, people have turned the hobby of crafting beer into a lifestyle. Amazing breweries are only a few minutes away from your own home. From nano to regional or micro to macro, the question you won't need to ask is what's on tap? A year ago, Paul Dowden bought this place and decided I gotta put my brewery in there and Iron Horse Brewing Company became a reality. February 2020 was their soft open and in March 2020 was supposed to be their grand opening, but we all know what happened. Despite the pandemic, Paul and the Iron Horse Brewing Company kept chugging along and ever since then it's been great food and even better beer that they've been churning out here. We're an old railroad town, of course, which is where our theme comes from and you know with the mural here of the Strucka Viaduct. Uh, it's pretty important to me and my wife. We both grew up along the Starucca Creek, which comes under this viaduct. And uh, so we spent our whole childhood, you know, driving into town underneath this giant stone bridge that uh, they built back in the 1800s uh, by hand without like equipment, which is pretty amazing that they were able to build it. And this town, you know, historically had been a really booming town back in those times. And then like a lot of little towns, it kind of falls on hard times when, you know, that industry kind of, you know, dried up and moved away, so. Is that kind of like where the name comes from though too? Yep, so Iron Horse comes from that. Um, there was a, there's a train depot down here that uh, is the, the Strucka House. And uh, it, I get differing answers on this. When I was a kid, I remember older relatives saying they were going to the Iron Horse and I could never figure out like where they were going because like it's the Strucka House. But you know, I was a kid and uh, apparently inside there was some kind of sign um, or poster that was framed that had Iron Horse on it. So like that was like the slang name of the Strucka House was the Iron Horse, but the actual place was legally the Strucka House. So um, it took me a, a lot of years as a kid to wonder where the heck they were going at night because I didn't know where the Iron Horse was. So, uh, and then that closed up 10 or 15 years ago. So when it came around, uh, no one uh, here had uh, rights to the name. So we were like, let's go with that name because again, it means a lot to the town, you know, Iron Horse because of the, the railroad history. And we knew, uh, you know, with the mural on here, we wanted to kind of go with that kind of theme. And now with, when someone says, I'm going to the Iron Horse, they know, they're coming to Iron yeah, Horse. Yeah, exactly where you're heading. <laughs> and as far as your Iron Horse here, this is a relatively new setup for you guys. What led to you being able to move in here? We are originally from this town, and when we decided to raise our kids here um, and, and put the brewery in, uh, we felt like it was important to do it in town. Like we looked at a lot of properties in bigger areas, like the, you know, near us that have bigger populations, and we actually looked at a lot of properties out of town as well. But we just felt like it would be important to town and to us to be right like on the heart of Main Street. You know, we have a tiny little Main Street here, but to us, this is our town. So we kind of thought it would be cool to, to put our new brewery and like make our investment right here on Main Street. And we hope that it would kind of, in a way, kind of encourage others. You know, we got tired of seeing empty storefronts. So we thought, you know, maybe if we put something in town, maybe it'll increase the foot traffic a little bit. And maybe then other people will see, you know, that it's not such a bad place to have some kind of small business. And, and honestly, and not that we can, I want to claim credit for this, but since we have been here for the couple months we have, um, there are a couple new businesses that have popped up. There's a new bakery, a new ice cream shop, a new like craft place. Um, so it's kind of nice to see storefronts that had been vacant for several years now be full. And whether it was just we weren't the only ones who had an idea it was time to put a business in town or whatever. It's That's what we had hoped would happen and that you kind of start to see a busy Main Street and not come here at five or six in the afternoon and there not be any cars on Main Street. When did you get started brewing? I've been brewing for quite a few years at home. I started, I, was, uh, I would say, first having an interest, well, let me back up. I'm, you know, I'm essentially a science nerd. so I'm, my degree is in molecular and cellular biology, and I remember, you know, growing yeast uh, in my microbiology labs uh, before I had any thoughts of like throwing it in beer and you know or in wort and seeing what would happen. 
And then I was a chemistry teacher uh, as my first you know, career. So I have a, a big science background. And I had some buddies who got into brewing. Um, they, uh, they started with wine, um, and uh, one of them was a kid who grew up close to me in my town here. One was a guy who ended up being the best man at my wedding, and they started making wine. I never really had an interest in making wine, but it definitely, you know, I always enjoyed good beer, and you know, I enjoyed the science, and that actually got me started in brewing. And instead of going to the wine like they were doing, I started making beer, and then you know, it kind of just it kind of just dominoed from there. You know, I started in my you know kitchen first, and then uh, when that wasn't sufficient, I built essentially a brew cave in my basement and. Uh, had a pretty good setup down there. And my kids would hate it because like if I, especially if I was making like a double IPA or something that day that had like a gazillion pounds of hops in it, like they'd come home from school and the whole house would reek like hops <laughs> and they'd be like, oh, dad made beer today. <laughs> so they, they, they encouraged me to, you know, actually put a brewery in because they're like, we'll get dad out of the brew yeah, cave and the house here, won't yeah. stink anymore. <laughs> when did you open up here? So we bought this uh, essentially October 1st of last year, 2019. And uh, we had a lot of renovations to do, and so it was uh, right towards the end of February when we did that soft opening, and then our uh, grand opening was scheduled to be uh, in the beginning of March, and literally was the Saturday when uh, things kind of came to a halt for everybody. So we never actually had that grand opening, so we're kind of missing out on that. So uh, I'm looking forward to someday still getting to do that when we're able to, to do such a thing again. So Looking through the list, it does seem there's a pretty big variety. Yeah. Are any of those stemming back to your original brewing days? Have you kept a couple on or have you kind of moved on? And No, actually uh, the, the brown ale that's up there right now was a version of one of the first beers I made. And uh, I actually, a buddy of mine came up with the name for that. He was actually uh, a former history teacher and he had moved on to being an administrator. And uh, he was not, you know, he was like a Mick Ultra kind of guy. The first time he tasted that beer, I think he plugged his nose and took a swig and thought he was gonna hate it. Like he was convinced he was gonna hate it because, you know, it wasn't gonna be Mick Ultra, you know, because it wasn't low carb and low alcohol. And uh, he was like, that's good. <laughs> and I'm like, you should try some craft beer. Like some of it is good, you know, and again, you know, he probably had had either someone's home brew or been to a brewery and had something that didn't fit what his taste profile was and, you know, kind of had that perception that, you know, he didn't like craft beer. And, uh, you know, he's like one of those stories of people that you try to recruit into this and say, hey, try this stuff. You may find something you like. You just recently opened and I know it's been a kind of a weird opening. Right. Uh, have you put any thought into like w what you would like to do next with with Iron Horse here. I'd love to experience what my original concept was and that was kind of to be like a community gathering spot where people could come in, sit down at the bar, grab a table, have a bite to eat, kind of socialize with people who they maybe hadn't seen in a week or two or maybe even a few months and we, you know as people come back into the town you know uh, in little towns a lot of people move away <clears throat> but when they come back to town they kind of want somewhere where they can go and maybe hang out a little bit and have a chance to kind of rekindle and reconnect with maybe people they haven't seen in quite a while. So that was kind of the concept and I'd really like to, you know, at some point when uh, the, the restrictions that have been mandated on us uh, will go, go away and, and they will, um, I'd, I'd really like to, to have that experience. And then from there we'll see, you know, my goal is never to get into this and do a lot of distributing. I mean, we do distribute a little bit, but I, I really just wanted a cool little tap room in the middle of my little town. And that that's kind of, I didn't set super lofty goals starting with, because, you know, I did this for, you know, not necessarily, you know, this is, I say, more my hobby than my actual job, because um, I just wanted something that was cool for town more than anything. Is that, your brew, where you brew, right yeah. here. So uh, you know, one of the one of the things I wanted. This was my thing. I, I didn't like going to breweries where everything's behind fire glass and like you got to peer through the window to like see all the cool shiny stuff. You know, I'm like a science guy, and I like you know, I like I like stuff, and I like to check it out. And I wanted my stuff to be accessible. Yeah. So. Um, I just by chance, when I was still at home and wanted to go to like a, a higher end all grain system, I found a company out in British Columbia um, in Canada and a guy uh, by the name of Nathan Jantz and he owns this company called Bruja. 
and he started making these all-in-one systems. Um, and uh, I bought a very small five-gallon system was my first one, and I started brewing in my base, my brew cave with that, and I loved it. It was great. I could make really good beer, and I thought I really liked the control you could have with it and all the things you could do with it, and I thought it was a really neat system. And it didn't take up a lot of space. That's why I went with it because you know a traditional brewery, you know when you have separate vessels, um, I didn't have that space in my brew cave at home. I wanted something with a small footprint. So same thing here, knowing we wanted to be in Main Street, knowing the way our Main Street is built, where like the buildings aren't huge, and I was going to be in a limited footprint, it was like the perfect fit because it allowed me to still have a full commercial brewery but to fit it in a, a footprint that you normally wouldn't be able to fit a full brewery in. So I actually have a 21 barrel capacity over there, which is pretty big capacity considering the amount of square foot that it all sits in. I'm sure you got to keep a lot of the favorites on. Right. Uh, how often are you making new beers and experimenting here? So pretty often. Um, I have a pretty extensive list, much like I said when I like to go drink beer, that I often try something new. Uh, same thing, I always have made new beers. Like I really rarely wanted to go back and like, you know, keep making the same beers. And I did, of course, because there are times you want to tweak that recipe and you didn't like, you know, what the flavor profile that you got in the end and you want to try to make it better. Um, but I've always enjoyed making new. So I, you know, still um, in these vessels right now, there's going to end up being four that, you know, are kind of beers I make on a fairly regular basis. And then three of them um, will be uh, newer products that I, you know, have made before, but they're not ones that I actually, n those three, none of them have been released here. So we're now joined for the food with Karen Downton, who was my fourth grade teacher, so she's, she's Mrs. Downton to me. So <laughs> uh, it's weird saying Karen. Thanks for joining us. Thank this you is for a wonderful, what a special episode this is. I've had a couple. We were at we did Muddy River, and you know, that was someone I knew as growing up. So he knew me as this tall. You knew you got you really did get to yell at me at this tall. I don't think I ever had to yell at you. I, I tried my best to be I'll a good believe student. That for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we're gonna get into these burgers here. I'm really excited. So this is the Iron Horse Bourbon Burger. And the, uh, what do you guys want to tell us about this? It's delicious. That's all I need to know. So it's got a bourbon flavored barbecue sauce um, mixed with a, kind of a mayonnaise base. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, there's some onion rings and some drizzle over the top. And uh, in the end, it's got a little bit of sweet, a little bit of, you know, the spice from the barbecue sauce. It's definitely juicy, and uh, that burger, people wow. love that burger. Um, that is a great tasting burger. Yeah, that has become our best selling burger, that's for sure. <clears throat> definitely deserves to have the Iron Horse name stamped too, because this is incredible. It's the perfect mix, the, the sauce, it might be everywhere. Yeah, it's but it's incredible. Those, you like can't put it down. No. Like it's one of those things. Once it's where in your hand, it's this is yours. And you don't like, really want to put it down. No. I want to dip my little, fries in the sauce yes, too. Yeah. Yes, you do. It's got a little zest to it, which is nice, but it's also got, like you said, the sweetness to it. The onion rings are a nice touch. Yeah, with one, the bacon. one of our sons would eat that for three meals a day if we'd let him. He loves that burger. I think I would eat this for three meals a day. I mean, this is awesome. You guys got a really great menu here with a lot of different things. Of course, you got the cheesesteak. We're in Pennsylvania. Yeah. You think of Philly. Yes. But you're also so close to Binghamton with the Speedies. Absolutely. So. We had a couple in yesterday that stopped us and asked what was a chicken speedy. What a speedy was. Because yes. we have wraps, we have sandwiches, we have salads. Some of our pizzas have the speedy on it. Um, we like to go out to dinner a lot and we like to go to nice places. So it was important for me to be able to have that kind of an experience in Susquehanna. It's a small town, but I feel like the people here deserve to be able to come out to dinner and get something that you would be able to get at more of a higher end place, not in town. So that was kind of, I think, our rationale for the wedge salad sure. and some burgers and kind well, we of- We wanted to keep it casual too. Again, right. it's a brewery, it's an informal place. You're here to have, you know, good conversation, a good time. And so we're not looking to serve, you know, three, four, five course meals. We want to have good comfort food, something that fills you up was a reasonable price and allowed you to enjoy the uh, beer or two you chose to drink while you're with us. So um, that was really our, our goal. Um, 
This is delicious. This is really, really, really good. Okay. Like, I mean that. I, I, I know my food. <laughs> I love this. This is really good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. I haven't been able to stop. Yeah. <laughs> I got to have the brown ale as we did the interview, and I love that. You got to have the sour, but he's got a lot more beers here on tap at Ironhorse Brewing Company. I think it's time for us to pour four. We'll start wherever you want to start. So when we start around the end and we'll just work our way down, that'll be oh, easiest perfect. for us. So the first one we have here is one of our IPAs. It's kind of a West Coast style, so you see it's pretty clear. And this is Uncle Stu's Yellow Topper, uh, who's named for a relative of ours. And he really enjoys this beer, and so he got to have the name after him. Pretty drinkable IPA. Uh, it's definitely got some, some bite to it, but the, the IBU, I think on that, is somewhere around 80. Um, so it's not like, Outrageous, but yet it's you definitely know it's an IPA, you know, and uh, there's no doubt about it. So, yeah, it is for you know, it's not one of those things where you're going, you know, from the bitterness, you, right. you get that earthy, hoppy taste to it, but really kind of crisp at the same time and goes down nice and easy. It's got a light feeling to it, yeah. you know, it, light on the tongue, it really drinks easy, it drinks nice, and you know, even with a high IBU, sometimes you get kind of right. like. It could, you could feel a little worried with that. And I think, you know, the ingredients that go with, into this, everything that you're putting into this, I mean, what kind of, you know, hops are you using, you know? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple different varieties of hops that, in that one, that's kind of a mixed uh, variety. There's some uh, citra hops in that, and uh, there's also some Centennial that are mixed in with this one, so. Um, and I, I, I like the combination with those that has kind of turned out well for me, so. And as I said, that one is a pretty popular beer for us. Uh, people seem to really enjoy that particular IPA uh, out of all the ones that we have up there, so. It's good, really good flavor. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it almost is like a sweetness, but it's not like that sweet taste, like where you're like, oh, super sweet. No, it's not yeah. sweet, like, it's just like, I don't know, it's that easy drinking yeah. taste that it is what it is. That's the line, that's, that's the name. That, that again, a lot of my beers, you know, they're kind of designed that way, as I mentioned earlier in our interview. A lot of the people that I started making beer for, um, you know, weren't craft beer fanatics, so they, they needed something that was gonna be palatable to them. And so uh, that's kind of the goal with a lot of these, to, to make it uh, that type of beer. So the, 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 a wide variety of people can enjoy it. You don't have to just be an IPA nut to like that beer. Well, let's move on. So number two, this one has been very popular this summer. So this is a, essentially a, a blonde ale that uh, I then uh, add blueberry to and uh, honey from a local guy who does honey here. So it's got locally sourced honey, which I think is kind of important to try to use local products whenever I can. So this is our Sabre Blueberry Blonde Ale. And uh, this one, I'm not a huge like fruit in my beer kind of guy. So the, the blueberry to me is fairly subtle in it, but you can definitely taste it. Um, same thing with the honey, but I like the profile that comes out of it in the end. I have said those exact words. <laughs> I think on an episode, yeah. I'm not a fruit in the beer. We said <laughs> Cooperstown Brewing Company yeah. before, and that's I'm the same way. I was like, I don't want it to be too much. Right. You de you taste the blueberries, yep. and yeah. it's like right there. It's you know, yep. it, this is how I think you're. It's supposed to be like when you have when you add a fruit to the right. beer. You don't want it to be this overpowering, like punch you in the face taste. It's yeah. it's a beer. It's got to be there with the flavor. To me, a lot of blueberry ales. Like in the end, something about my palate, they leave a tartness that I just don't enjoy from that blueberry flavor. Where this, I think because it's balanced with that, you know, again, locally sourced honey that we throw in there, I don't get that feel from it. And I think because of that, it's a very easy beer to drink. It's nice and light. It's, you know, uh, not super carbonated either. And people, people, love this beer. It balances out really well and it's almost like when you're eating blueberries. You get the smaller, tartier ones and that's what I thought of yeah. with most, like you said, you, it leaves you with that aftertaste. It's like you took those big, juicy, sweet ones and that's the that's the subtle flavor that you're getting. It's a lot sweeter, but it's still, it's it's hinting at the blueberry. It's right. not, here's blueberry, here's a bunch of blueberries I mashed in here. It's really tasty. So let's move on to so number three. Now this is one uh, that I chose because this, this, like I said, out of all the ones I have on tap right now, probably has the deepest roots of any of the beers. This beer dates back to like some of the first beers I ever made. So it's a, a version of a brown ale. Uh, so it's got some, you know, like caramel flavors in it. And uh, this one again uh, is, is kind of sweet, but it has a little enough of the bitterness to it to kind of balance out the fa flavor profile. It has a little kickback at the end from that bitterness, mm -hmm. but 
the initial taste that the maltiness to right. it. I'm glad I I had this one yeah. when we were right. sitting for the interview and I, I've been, I, I think it's just, so we're making this in September. I think it's gonna come out around October. Right. Um, and it's getting to that time of the year where I like to transition to, we all make yeah, those transitions. Right, yeah, you drink yeah. the light beers for the summer, you start getting Absolutely. a little bit darker and darker as you go on. And I'm very seasonal with my beer taste as well. And yeah, that one, I, I think again, um, has been surprisingly popular this summer. Like I'm amazed how many people come in and when they decide to take their crawlers home or their four packs home, that's the one they choose. Something about that beer, it's not so, you know, it's not as thick as a stout, uh, but yet it still has enough of that dark characteristic to it that people seem to really enjoy us. Can you kind of give us a little insight as with the name? Where did that come from? Because it kind of caught my eye as soon as you look over at the board and what's on tap. So, uh, yes, so my buddy's a jokester. Because he was such a big proponent of this particular beer, I told him that he could have naming rights. And, and uh, there was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the name he came up with. Uh, I got some clarification and uh, he gave me a very eloquent dissertation on how uh, in olden days, again, being a railroad town, that the uh, friction bearings on the trains, the caboose was there. If they didn't get lubricated well enough, they would become what's called a hot box and catch on fire. And that was, you know, one of the, the roles back in the day. And, I bought it and I sold off, I signed off on the name in the end with some reservations. And I think there are some ulterior motives there. That name comes in a couple different layers and I don't think we just discussed them on this show maybe, but uh, <laughs> but uh, yes. Yeah. So in the end, I did sign off on the name and uh, honestly, people kind of like the whimsy of that name and they're, you know, they always want to know the story. Like how did, how did you come up with a name like that? And I have to say, you know, it wasn't my name. It's This is what happens when you give your buddy naming rights and let him name a beer, so. All right, and then last in the uh, pour four, this is uh, one of our oatmeal stouts. So this one is, has another uh, railroad derived uh, name, uh, Black Maria. Uh, this comes from, again, not only we're a railroad area, but you know, there's a lot of coal mining that happened, especially just south of us. And the Black Maria uh, was what, you know, the coal miners historically referred to as like the the, the, the uh, horse-drawn carriage that would come and act as either an ambulance or a, mainly as a hearse when there were accidents. And so kind of a homage to that uh, coal mining history from our area. I went with that name for this stout. You know, it's dark and rich and sweet. And, and that's one for me in the wintertime, like that's a beer I want to drink. Like yeah. when it's cold out and I want to like sit by the fireplace and like have Two of those beers. I'm feeling it as we're making this episode, my transition of where I want to, what beers I want to yeah. buy right now, because okay. just having the stout, it's just like, it, it, it's such a warming feeling. It's starting to get a little bit more chilly out. We're starting right. to get more into fall. And it's like, and the oatmeal stouts too. You, you have, they're, it's a common, a lot of people are doing oatmeal stouts. And I feel like, you know, th this is great. Like just, uh, I haven't had a lot of oatmeal stouts. Right. I, I, a lot of people do them, I don't have them often. Yeah. The mouth feel on that, you know, it kind of, coats your palate and kind of stays there with you, but you kind of get that sweet taste that stays around with a little bit of that chocolatey and like almost a little bit of a coffee undertone yeah. to it. The more I drink it, I'm really getting that chocolate taste oh, yeah. with it. And it's just, yeah. it, it's really just really good. Yep. It's like, it's just really, really good. Yeah. Like, I love how, I love that. It tastes as good as it looks yeah. and it came out looking tremendous. Uh, this is an aw this is awesome. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much for you yeah. know, going through these I, I really us. appreciate you guys making the trip down here to. Uh, Pennsylvania and uh, we'll be the last man. Try we'll this out, and uh, we're always happy to have new people in Susquehanna and experiencing what uh, the community can provide for everybody. Uh, so uh, again, I really appreciate you guys coming. It means a lot. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Thank you for having us. It's actually really nice. I like it. It's calm, low key. It's really cool. Nice yeah. experience. Beautiful. Yeah. And beautiful individuals too, thank you. If, if a different restaurant in the town or any restaurant around here wants to like get a keg and put the Iron Horse on tap, like yeah, is we, that easy to get a hold of you? It, it is, yeah, and we, we have a couple places right now who are serving our product. Um, and we're, we're happy to do that. They can either uh, give us a call here at the brewery, um, uh, which is 570-853-4644, or we have a website, uh, ironhorsebrew.com, uh, and on there, there's an email link to us uh, and they can email us and I'm pretty good with uh, getting back with emails. Maybe not instantaneously, but uh, I will get back to you uh, as soon as I can, I promise. 
Thank you so much to Paul and everybody here at Iron Horse Brewing Company. I mean, this has been an incredible day. The beer has just been amazing. And really, thank you so much for joining us on our journey, our first trip across the state line going to PA here. Yeah, this definitely won't be our last trip out of New York, so be sure to follow along by subscribing to our YouTube page, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, everywhere, so you can see where our journey takes us next on What's on Tap. Cheers. Let's take some of these back over the border. Mm-mm-mm.